just so that everyone knows, um, I'm asking everyone to turn off the cameras and um, so that we can have full bandwidth because um, our esteemed guests today, uh, John Nelson, who works for ESRI but has um, a life outside of ESRI as well, or ESRI as we're now supposed to call it. Um, and so I'm going to ask that we turn off cameras. I'm going to keep you guys muted for a bit. And then um, after he presents, then what we'll do is we will um, open it up for questions. But if you have questions while he's talking, type it into the Zoom chat and I will uh, moderate that. I'm getting ready to turn off my camera and I'm going to turn it over to John. So thank you so much for joining us today. I know it was a thing that you put out on Twitter and um, you weren't sure if people are going to pick you up on it, but we were very enthusiastic here at William & Mary. Well, I'm happy that you took me up on it. Thanks. It's an honor. All right. So I'm stopping my video. Feel free to grab the share screen when you're ready. And Yeah, I can do that. Okay. So share screen. Let me know. Let me see. It should be a big blank Google page. Google. We're there. Right. Okay, cool. Well, yeah, thanks again, of course. Um, I was telling Shannon beforehand that both my parents are geography teachers. My dad taught geography at university for decades, and my mom was my middle school geography teacher. And so when all of this, when all the mandates came where the universities were closing and the colleges were closing and all the schools were closing, and they said, well, we're just going to go online now. I thought, oh my goodness, how do you just go online? And a lot of folks are in a good position where they've got um, well, they're savvy, you know, they've got the online skills to do that kind of thing, or maybe they already teach online courses in our practice. But I'm thinking about my dad, which he's retired now, but if he were still teaching and they said, okay, Bert, you have to go online, you'd first have to ask them what they meant. Like, what's online? <laughs> what do you mean online? And so anything I can do to, to make, make the teaching experience still roll along in these crazy times. I'm happy to do it. So it's it's not just something I'm happy to do. I'm honored to do it. And I hope everybody is doing well and staying safe and keeping clear of that crazy virus. These are weird times that we're all living in right now. And it's just, it's bizarre. So stay safe and be well. That's my intro. Stay safe and be well. So if you can still see my screen, I'm just going to dive right in. Um, it sounds like you've got a really cool class by the way, when I was hearing a description of it from Shannon, I thought, man, that, that's a class that I want to actually be enrolled in. Um, so anyways, let's get into it. Geo Viz, come on, that's great. Uh, speaking of Geo and Viz, let's try to visualize some fire data from NASA. I'm gonna go to Google and just search for NASA fire, fires from space. Fire maps, fire and smoke observatory. Active fire data. Okay, so I found active fire data, NASA Earth data. Um, it's pretty amazing. There's two satellites that are whizzing around the Earth at all times. They're offset from each other so that there's pretty much uninterrupted coverage, right? They, they kind of circle the Earth in tandem. When one is on one side of the Earth, the other satellite is on the other so that there isn't a break in what they're covering. And they beam that down to our planet and stooges like me can just download that in whatever file format I want, which is insane. What a time to be alive, right? We're alive in the time of coronavirus, but we're also alive in the time of robots circling our planet, sending us automated thermal detection data. That's pretty great. So I'm gonna expand this one called TXT. It's just a simple TXT file. Um, and I'll choose this satellite, MODIS satellite, for you know either one. And I'll choose seven days for the whole world. And I've downloaded that. And I'm just going to open it. In, yes, Microsoft Excel. I bet you didn't think you'd be getting a Microsoft Excel demo in your GeoViz guest lecture, but you are. OK, so let's, we've got latitude, we've got longitude. There's a thing called brightness. Scan and track just talks about what path along the Earth it's covering. Um, the acquisition date, which of course is pretty interesting. This goes back seven days, of course. What time it was, which satellite pinged it, A versus T. Um, how confident the uh, 
robots are that are processing this is that it's actually a fire. Um, so I, I should tell you what this is. This is something called a thermal anomaly. And the satellite is hovering around. It's, it's actually taking pictures, but it's got a sensor on board that can detect a heat signature. And if it detects something that's anomalous, like there isn't always heat there and it's really hot, um, it, it pings it and it sends it down as a little that long point. And it gives you this information. How bright was it? That's cool. FRP is really interesting. It's fire radiative power. This is how much energy is being emitted in that one by one square kilometer uh, piece of the earth. Was it in day or was it in night? That sort of thing. So let's select this. And I'm going to do what's called a pivot table. So I'll insert pivot table. Pivot tables are really cool because you aren't stuck with the tyranny of rows and columns as your table is given to you. You can say, well, screw rows and columns. I want to take some uh, slice and dice of my data. For example, maybe I want to take, gosh, uh, let's see, which satellite captured the fire? And I'll drag that as my rows. And then I can say, let's take a look at, well, was it, was it day or was it night? And we'll make that a column. And then this FRP value I'll drag in here. And it sums up all of the fire radiative power. So now I'm looking at which satellite detected the fire. Was it day? Was it night? That's pretty amazing. And that's called a pivot table. So you're not stuck with rows and columns. Uh, you can do whatever you want. And I'm looking at some numbers. And I actually have to my brain has to do some work and I don't like that. Um, if you know me, I don't like thinking very hard. And these numbers are abstractions. All numbers are abstractions for some sort of reality. And they're really handy and they're an amazing tool for adding things up and, and uh, conveying data, but they aren't necessarily data themselves. They're, they're, just, uh, they're just representations of something. And we need to push this data into something more meaningful like information. And one way to do that is by color coding. So if I select those and I go into conditional formatting, that's just a helpful little tool that lets me say, um, here, color code it based on those values in an automated fashion. So, oh man, that's really hot. I get it now. Okay, there's not much fire going on at night for satellite A. Immediately, my mind gets it. I can latch onto this visualization and I can. Uh, surmise some things and have some takeaways because I didn't have to think so much about, wow, is this number bigger than this one? How, one, two, three, four, five digits, that kind of thing, right? Immediately I have an impression of something. Now, map makers love this sort of thing. I mean, you don't have to convince us that looking at colors is a little bit better than looking at raw numbers, right? We get that, of course, and it's kind of the name of the game when it comes to making geographic visualizations. So I was looking at this. And I'll just get rid of this pivot table. I was looking at this, and of course, like I said, I'm a map maker and I'm a geographer, and latitude and longitude is a little bit exciting for me in a in a way that regular numbers and data types aren't, because there's this entire spatial dimension that is represented in them that's kind of tucked inside them that you can you can extrapolate. So let me first create a new version of these lat longs, and I'm just going to round it to the nearest number to, to, to make them whole numbers. I'll say equals round, and I'll choose this latitude field, and I'll say I want zero degrees of decimal places of precision. OK, so 27 latitude. By the way, latitude, change in latitude, change in attitude. That's how I remember it. Latitude, you go up. You go north, you go south, that's latitude. Uh, longitude is east-west. So let's go over to the longitude and say equals round, and I'll say this longitude, zero degrees of precision, 141, 140.8. All right, we're doing well. And I'll just flood fill down by clicking that little green guy in the corner. Okay, and I'll say lat short. That shot, it's a drinking game. And I'll say 
long short, which I understand is a rather ironic name. And I'll go here. And you know what? Confidence is very important. Right here, this is it's 0% confident that that's actually a fire. Uh, well, hey, NASA, why did you include it in the status? I don't know, but we aren't stuck. We can go into the data tab and do a little filter and say, just don't include all these guys or, you know, I could, I could get specific, but let's just say, don't include it if it's so uncertain. There we go. Now we just reduced our data set a little bit based on confidence levels. Okay, now I'm gonna make another pivot table, insert pivot table. And like I was saying, latitude is nothing more than up downiness, right? It's just a hack that humans have conjured up to carve up our earth so that we can describe where we're actually talking about in concrete terms. So latitude happens to be north south, which is just up down. And really all that is, is rows. So I'll take my latitude, my shortened latitude, and I'll drop that into the rows. Now the way latitude works is um, the south pole is negative 90, it goes up to zero at the equator, and then it goes up to positive 90 at the top. So I'm gonna reverse this default sort, say sort from Z to A, so the higher numbers are at the top. Now longitude is nothing more than east-westiness. Longitude is east-westiness. And east-westiness is just columns, if you think about it that way. So let's drag longitude into the columns. And then we'll grab our interesting little fire radiative power value and we'll drop it here. Let's select all these and just give them a slightly more rectangular appearance. And then I'm gonna zoom out. Now I know you're muted, but you're supposed to shout out loud right OMG. now. OMG. What you're seeing. I am gonna voice it for everyone on here. OMG. Okay. What is this? Shannon, what is this? Well, it looks like the world to me. No, it's not. It's a pivot table. These are just <laughs> cells. Okay, so let's grab these. And like I was saying, cartographers and map makers and any kind of data viz nerds like to color code, right? Don't, don't hide the crayons from us. So let's select these. We'll give it a, like a dramatic black background. We'll go into our conditional formatting. And we'll say this time I want to do three colors, make this darkest one like a deep bluish purple. We'll go red and then we'll make it bright yellow. And instead of the max, we'll go the top 10 percentile. And 10 percentile here as well. And then we'll hit OK. And now we've got a color coded map of the world rendered as one degree aggregation units of released fire energy over the last week. And you might be wondering like, why am I showing you this, right? So one, it's just kind of neat to hack a tool to do something it wasn't intended to do. And if you don't remember anything else, remember that. Use your tools the way that you see fit because you are in charge. Um, Excel has no idea that it's just made a map. It only becomes a map when we look at it and our minds process it in a way that's spatial. And our paradigm tells us that this is a map. I can infer location information and have some location takeaways from this. Excel doesn't care, right? Um, ArcGIS doesn't know or care that you're making a map. It's just a bundled up pile of code. It's only there to let you do your job, right? Any kind of software is just a bunch of rules, if then statements that let you do your job. So don't feel pushed around or all that intimidated by software, right? If it stinks at what it does, that's its fault. That's not your fault. And make it do what you want it to do. And the second thing I want to say regarding this is that geography is different. So geographic visualization is different 
Geography will find a way, right? These are just latitude longitude numbers, but when you arrange them just so because of your geographic thinking, it becomes a map. Geography is special. Latitude and longitude aren't just another form of data. It's this kind of through the looking glass sort of experience where you can do all sorts of science and visualization that regular numbers just aren't capable of because there's so much inherent potential cooked into latitude and longitude. It's the language of where, which is amazing. All right, so uh, there's a map-ish kind of thing, right? A hacked map. Could I, could I filter this by one day and then another day and then another day and then do a simple calculation to show the change in fire between days? Yes, I absolutely could do that. And I'd be doing it in Microsoft Excel. Now, I just got done telling you that, you know, software is dumb and it doesn't really matter and you can make it break the rules. But your life is going to be a lot easier if you're using tools that were designed and created and intended for the same purpose that matches your goal, right? So if I'm actually making a map, I'm not necessarily going to pull up Excel first. I'll bring up map making software, which is uh, part of the experience that you guys, I would imagine, are embarking on. Um, and so life gets a lot easier when you use a tool that's more in line with what your goals are. So I will close this. Yes, I'm not even going to save it because it's so easy. Close this. Um, now, speaking of change detection with cell values, uh, a couple of years ago, I was uh, goofing around on the internet, looking at Twitter, as I do 95% of the time. Don't tell anybody, this isn't recorded, hopefully. Wait. And anyways, I saw an announcement from NASA that said, we've just re-released our Earth at night imagery. So I was used to working with 2012's The Earth at Night image. And they released one in 2017 that said, this is new, you know, it's based on 2016 data. This is now The Earth at Night. And it was uh, an update. And The Earth at Night is just, a uh, collection of satellite images that show the surface of our planet in the dark. And there's all sorts of beautiful inferences you can make about the lights and the glowing surfaces uh, of uh, our little locations on the earth. You know, we're strung together like little Christmas tree strands. This is humans. This is probably the best self-portrait of humanity that I've ever seen. How else can all of a single species be represented in such a profound way and simple way like this. This is where we are, this is us. And I was looking at it and they were showing 2012 versus 2016 over here on the right. And they had a like the simple swipe tool, which was really nice. And I was like, wow, that, that's pretty amazing. What's going on? You know, they're leaving here, they're, they're turning on more lights over there. That's really great. And what was going on is, my, my eyeballs take this in and my brain processes it. It stores this picture in my leaky working memory. And then I go over to 2016 and then I do some kind of Herculean weird stuff in my mind that does a subtraction of one and the other. So I can do a, a, an on the fly difference detection. Human brains are really good at that because it helps us not get eaten by lions on the savanna. But there's a lot going on, right? And our brains run a little bit hot and it's not very confident or accurate, especially when you wanna do some precise data takeaways. So I downloaded the 2012 image and the 2016 image and thought, gosh, there's gotta be a better way than to just swipe between these two things. And so oh, you're seeing all my little weird screens I had open for the work day. So I opened them up. So here's 2012, right? The Earth at night. There's India. Here's the Nile Delta, which is just blazing with light. It's fascinating. And then here's the updated 2016 data. And so I got these and I was just doing, you know, what people do. On, off, on, off on off and like i said my brain was having to do the difference calculation and i was like well, what am i doing i've got this system here that's designed to do remote sensing and change detection so let's let the computers do the work and we can just do the thinking 
and get the takeaways from that. So let's open the imagery tab and there's a group of tools called raster functions. And I poked around and I eventually realized, well, I wanna subtract one from the other. If I subtract 2012 from 2016, that should give me a good change. And I found this tool called Minus. It was actually the first one I picked and I wasn't sure if it was the right tool. It turned out it was. 2016 minus 2012 equals, boom, look how quick the robot figured that out. And oh my goodness, look at that, right? We are looking at the change in humanity's location and activity on the surface of the earth over five years in a matter of a split second. That's bananas, that's just bananas. So the white areas here are increased light. The gray areas mean no significant change in the nighttime illumination. And the black areas represent areas where the light has gone dimmer or completely out. I was looking at this and I thought, well, let's, let's get rid of the gray so that we can see through to the existing 2012 imagery. And let's choose a different color scheme. So. If I open up the symbology tool here, I'll expand this and I'll choose format color scheme. I'm not stuck with solid black to solid white, right? Um, let's make this black to black. I will drag this handle here and I'll say you are gonna be 100% transparent. Actually, let me pick a, let me pick a darkness color. So I'm gonna pick, um, it's a violet color for where the lights have dimmed or gone out altogether. So I'll pick the same violet color. I think, no, that wasn't the same, was it? There we go. I'll make it 100% transparent. Now I can see through to the underlying earth below. And I'll choose a, an embrightened color. So let's go with solar yellow. I mean, that makes sense. And then I'll add another stop here. I'll choose the same solar yellow. And of course, I'll make this 100% transparent as well. So, gosh, that's just so Lakers-y. I hate that. Uh, I'm gonna go like, darker. Ugh. Anyways, we're in a rush. So lights out, lights on, lights new, and then no change, okay? Let's see what that looks like, okay. So I've turned off 2016. The result is I'm looking through at 2012. So I can see where nighttime lights exist and yellow shows me where they're new and purple shows me where they've dimmed or gone out altogether. I think that's just fantastic. There are so many stories that are inherent in this visualization. Um, when I looked at this, I thought, gosh, what is going on in India? And so I looked it up. I looked it up, and it turns out in the course of those five years, there was a big electrification push to bring electricity to these rural, but highly populated areas of Northeast India. And electrification in rural, low-income areas represent amazing opportunity. There's study after study that say that this is perhaps the single most way, single best way that one generation can improve its lot over the previous generation is the opportunity of electricity and the communication um, connectivity that that brings and the increase in the potential uh, work that can be done there and mechanization and an, an overall improvement of life. And that's profound. Um, and then I looked over here right? What's going on? This is Syria. You can almost see its precise borders based on the fact that in these intervening five years, it's been almost entirely plunged into darkness because of conflict and civil war, except for two newly glowing bright spots in the desert that are staging areas, right? Otherwise, the entire country has gone dark, right? And so 
you see this balance, right? Any, any portrait of humanity is gonna have great good and it's gonna have great bad. It's got beautiful, hopeful things and it's got uh, shameful, sad things. Um, and this just kind of washed over me a little bit. And uh, there's, there's a lot that, that can be said of a visualization like this. But again, this was just um, the result of a little bit of curiosity, uh, one click of a button, and uh, some existing open source imagery that NASA had provided. Hey, John, there's a question. Um, Pablo wants to know, are a lot of the purples in the Persian Gulf related to oil or gas burn off not electricity, meaning less refining, potentially? Yeah, it's a good question. Now, I won't uh, pretend to be an expert on nighttime lights and human migrations, but what I would expect is going on here is these are areas that were being played for petroleum resources, and they have been moved. So uh, they were drilling here, and now they're drilling here. They were you know, drilling over here, and now they've kind of moved to this area. Um, there's also fishing fleets that become visible off the coast of Africa. I don't think I've got it. Now, I don't have it quite in this extent, but if I have a global extent, there are fishing fleets that appear um, to move because you know they're they're hitting one location uh, quite a lot any in one year, and then they move another year to a to a different location to to play out that area. So yeah, it's um it's it's an interesting visualization because what's good, what's bad. You know, is it is it good that you've played out a fishing area? Is it bad? I mean, if you're a fisherman, it's good that you're moving and finding new opportunity. Is it is it good that you're moving your uh, petroleum extraction? Well, it is if you're the one doing the extraction and you're the one benefiting from burning those fuels, like we all do. Um, of course, on the other hand, we suffer the consequences for those um, those things as well. So it's it's a very balanced, nuanced, complex picture. I don't know if that answered your question, Pablo. Yeah, that, that got it. I was just wondering, it, it was kind of interesting. Uh, I'd love to think that there's less uh, refining in the oil in the Middle East, but uh, I think that, that kind of explains it. Thanks. Yeah, you're welcome. Now, I don't have it in this extent, but the United States was very interesting. So the upper Midwest, um, is bursting with new, it would be yellow light in this visualization because of um, the increase in natural gas exploitation and refining in, in that area. Just like an energy boom that we've never seen before happened five years ago in those areas. And, and that part of the United States is just lit up. Um, okay, well, I'm looking at the clock and I'm a half hour in and I've got through two out of three of the things I was going to show you. We could move on to questions and answers if you prefer. Oh, Shannon, no, or? you need to do the third one. I'm just going to say, if you don't mind. And then oh, okay. we'll if you if you're going to hang in with us. Yeah, well, I got the time. I'm, I'm, I'm under I'm a shelter in place mandate as well. Yeah, and I'm thinking most of my students would probably agree with me on this and the, the others that are in the in the room. Okay, so another thing I was going to show you, kind of to pivot off the fact that I had taken an image and instead of being stuck with the default color scheme of black to white, I pushed transparency into the midtone so I could see through because I'm not I'm not stuck with the color scheme as is. You've always got control over something like that. So I was going to um, extend that that message with an example from the shaded relief archive this this is an amazing resource um, Bernhard Jenny and Tom Patterson manually scanned all these fantastic old hill shades that were drawn by cartographers map makers of the past people who would actually specialize in taking point based elevation data for an area and running it through the insanely complex um, AI of their brains and determining what the hillshade would actually look like on the surface of the earth. And it's important to rem remember that um, 
this was done before satellites and before we had um, spacecraft that were in space looking down on the Earth. This is, they were like, well, it probably looks like this based on the point data that they had. And they could, they could do these beautiful works of art that actually communicated a lot of information too. Um, so I was on the fence. Do I, do I show you an example where I actually geo-reference one of these to breathe into it spatial life? and then kind of monkey with its color or just use one that's already geo-referenced. And just looking at the time, I'll just go with one that's already geo-referenced. Um, and I'm just randomly pretty much picking this one, Latin America, Schutzler, okay, good. So I'm glad I randomly picked this one, Herwig Schutzler. Um, they have some really interesting uh, metadata about all these too. And it is geo-referenced. You probably don't know what geo-referenced means, and it's simple. It's um, as far as a geographic information system like this is concerned. This image is just a photograph. It could be like my school picture when I was twelve. It doesn't know any different. It's just a bunch of rows and columns of pixel data, but this is actually representing a geographic thing, and so you have to tell the GIS where this lives on the surface of the earth. And there's a cool way of doing that where you can push pins in this and align them with real life locations. And then this kind of warps like a rubber sheet to the surface of the earth and you can save it, which is neat. Cause then you can change the projection. This happens to be a Lambert as mutual equal area projection, but you could then switch it to a completely different projection and it would warp to meet the demand of that projection, which is awesome. Let me just shut up and download this and show you some stuff. So I'll save this. Uh, and you can see I'm uh, a big fan of this. I've got a folder dedicated to it. Latin America Schutzler, okay, I'll save it. It's saved, that's pretty impressive. Um, I'll show it in the folder. There it is. So here's my zip file. And I'll just copy this, I'll unzip it. That's all I'm doing. Okay, Latin America. There's the image and this is the little file that gives it information about where it should live on the surface of the earth. It's geo-reference information. Let me get rid of this stuff. Remove, okay. And I'll give you a base map just so we have some context. I'll do imagery. This is just a satellite image base map, okay. And now I'll drag this in. Okay, see how it's warped? It's not rectangular. It knows this is a different projection and so it's doing its job and saying, okay, here it is, true to life. See if I turn it off. On, uh, on, uh. Um, so I love these. There's a mastery involved here and, and I like, I'm an admirer of any craft done lovingly and with skill. It's, uh, it's a beautiful world and people are amazing creatures. I'm gonna make this look a little bit better. Um, and I'm just fascinated by what they do, including the work of Herwig Schutzler here, who hand drew this from spot elevation data in, in the 1970s. So sometime in the 1970s. Good for you, Herwig. Thank you for your good work. So let's play with this. Let's say we're not stuck with black to white. So the way that light works is if you ever look at a shadow, it's not really black and then shades of gray. Light scatters differently in the different parts of the spectrum. So the blues, and the greens are short wavelength and they get bounced around really easily by particles in the air. That's why when you look up, the sky is blue is because the gas of our atmosphere is kind of knocking around that light and the little short waves bounce off and start pinging everywhere and that's blue. Um, that's why the ocean looks bluish greenish because it hits the water and starts bouncing around everywhere and so it looks bluish green. Um, it's also why sunsets happen to be red and orange is because red the red end of the spectrum is made up of longer wavelengths that uh, do a better job of plowing through the atmospheric content. 
And so more of the red wavelengths land in your eyeballs from the sun because you're looking through a thick layer, uh, that pillowy blanket of life-giving uh, atmosphere that hugs our planet so precariously. You're seeing the red hit, and that's why a sunset is red, and that's why the sun looks red when it's very low on the horizon because it's going through so much atmosphere. Anyway, that's a light and remote sensing mini mini lesson. So let's say, okay, my shadow is going to be like a ultramarine. That sounds cool. And I'll bring this in a little bit and I'll make the very darkest shadows black. I don't know how this is going to look, but we'll find out together. And I'll make this semi transparent, make this like 20% transparent. And over here, I'll bring this in. And the shadows, I'll say they taper off, they scatter a little bit into um, the steel blue color, and I'll make that 100% transparent. So it's kind of this amber or this purple color. Let me darken that a little bit. Right, that's a little bit like a shadow. And then this, I'll also make him 100% transparent. Now the highlights, right? These areas where the light is hitting the surface of the mountains, the sunlit side, they don't have to be white, right? Sun is warm and you've got these kind of reddish amber hues coming through and they're striking directly on the side of that mountain. So let's give this kind of a nice kind of golden amber color. And that can fade all the way to white. That's fine. We'll just make it 100% transparent there. I'm making the white edge fully transparent so that this isn't all remaining. Let's hit OK. OK, and we're getting something kind of interesting. right? So here is South America, painted by Herwig Schutzler blended with imagery captured last year. Now let's tweak this a little bit. So I'm gonna make these tones, push them down a little bit. We'll bring our shadows out a little bit more, accentuate those things. And this is it. I mean, we're just playing around with color and coloring in. Let's bring these Shadows out a bit more, and we get we get something that's really quite interesting. This is hill shade that doesn't actually exist in the imagery. Here's our imagery for color context, and here's our hill shade for reference. If I get rid of the imagery, this is what we're seeing. It doesn't look like a whole lot, but when you see it in the context of imagery, it does. Um, now I was doing something like this um, on a map of the United States. A hillshade map of the United States, and um, I blogged about it. I showed a picture of the imagery. I showed a picture of the hand-drawn hillshade, and I showed a picture of them smushed together. And here's how you can do it—that kind of thing. Actually, it's here. I wrote a blog post called "How to Smash Vintage Hillshade into Modern Imagery," uh, and it looked like this. Right here's the image. You know, this is what I did. I just showed you all this stuff, and here's the imagery. And now they're on top of each other, and I put a little ocean overlay there to clean it up. And I was very proud of myself. I hit publish and I was like, ha, 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 that looks good. And a couple days later, I got an email. I got an email from someone named Herwig Schutzler. And it turns out Herwig was the artist who painted this in 1965. And I couldn't believe it. I was a little bit nervous. And then I read the, the letter and he said, he thinks it's wonderful that a cartographer of his time had produced something that was picked up by a cartographer of this time and were collaborating across the decades. And there's something pretty wonderful about that. And I agreed with him. There's something pretty wonderful about collaborating with, with uh, other makers across the decades. And we're always inspired by things that people make who come before us. And there's no reason it has to be people who are our contemporaries. You know, a lot of my Best inspirations come from map makers and data viz designers in the 1850s. Those people were bonkers. They were coming up with some amazing stuff in 1850 and putting it in atlases that like challenge me now. Like, how am I going to do this? Uh, even with all the tools that we have today. And so 
there's just so much creativity in the mind of a human that uh, you can draw from over the decades. And I thought that was uh, really great. Turns out Herwig was born and raised what ultimately became behind the Iron Curtain. So um, in, in a Soviet area of Europe, of Eastern Europe, and he escaped, came to the United States and worked as a cartographer for a, a map making company, a pretty well respected small map making company that was then bought up by a technology company and became MapQuest. So MapQuest was like the first online directions tool. And so Herwig was still working there at the time when it was MapQuest. And so my first introduction to online mapping had a lot to do with the work of Herwig Schutzler. I thought that was kind of neat too. These were connected to each other in ways that we wouldn't understand. So my takeaway from that was the things that I'm working on now, gosh, maybe they're going to inspire somebody 10 or 20 or 30 or maybe 50 years from now, they'll, they'll pick it up, they'll blow the dust off of it and they'll think, what was going on here? Maybe I can do something similar with the tools that I have. And that gives me a smile and a little bit of hope. And it makes me happy that the things that we do now matters and we're kind of passing the baton on to whoever comes after us. Anyway, that was the third thing that I was gonna show you. And I'm done with showing you the third thing that I was gonna show you. So I guess we could go to Q&A if anybody has questions now. Yeah, so can you do me one favor, John? First, I wanna thank you for doing the third demonstration because I think that that was just really amazing. Um, and you talk a little bit about, um, you know, your parents were, were geographers and um but how did you get into cartography like this like was this something that you fell into or is this because of you know always having geography in the home I, I think turn it yeah, over. i think there's there's no way that didn't have something to do with it because they were both teachers which meant we had summers off and so we'd all pile into the station wagon and cruise around the country in the summertime and my dad would take slides with his camera and then um use those in his lecture materials uh, in, in the classes afterwards. So I kind of grew up looking at the countryside and they love geography and talked about geography stuff at the dinner table. Um, can you still hear me? Looks like your video has frozen. I just want to verify that you, I'm still on. I turned it off. Okay, good. Okay, good. Um, yeah, but when I went to college, I had no idea what I wanted to be. I actually thought I was going to be an eye doctor. I thought that that might be kind of cool to be an eye doctor because I had an eye injury when I was young. And so it was, it was fascinating to me, the process. Um, I blew up a battery in my eyeball. And so they had to, they had to do stuff. Anyways, um, I thought maybe I'll be an eye doctor. And at a certain point when I was starting college, I knew I wasn't really going to be a doctor, but they always asked me what my major was. And so I would just put down that I was an undeclared pre-med student. And it was amazing how many professors commented on that on the first day of class when they're you know taking role oh you you who's here who's here oh pre-med huh Ooh, interesting and I was like, <laughs> so uh yeah and then i had a cartography class not cartography a G gis class which at the time was called computerized mapping mapping with computers and um i loved it it was cool you know, we saw these like kind of pseudo 3D meshes. We were making dot density maps. This was the late 1990s. And so I, I was not computer literate at all. So I, I had to play a lot of catch up and figuring out just, you know, how to turn a computer on. But it was a lot of fun. And I was kind of sucked in after that. At that point, I knew, yeah, this is a really good fit. Because I also minored in art. So I majored in geography, social science, and earth science. And my minor was art. So things that I was learning in art class, like filters and composition and layout balance and blending colors, obviously was playing a lot into my classes in remote sensing and geography and cartography. And the things I was learning in my map making classes started playing into my art classes. So understanding how light works and if you break it up into the different wavelengths, you know, you can filter it out for certain um appreciable effects and then that had a lot to do with my photography work so everything's related to everything else you know 
if you've got two different interests, of course they're going to start colliding in your brain. I don't think there's, I don't think anybody's got any questions, Shannon. Well, we're, uh, we're a liberal arts university, so everything that you are saying, um, I know that there are a lot of the folks that are on this that are, are saying, yes, yes, I took that art class. I, you know, I've done this thing that doesn't seem to match, but it will match eventually. It matters. Yeah, you can make nice. it match. Yeah. Um, I've got one that, so I'm getting some questions that are pri coming in private, and I've also got ones that are coming into the chat. So uh, I had um, one of them, what are some cool challenges you're looking to tackle this year, or do they have any COVID-19 related plan projects? Um, and uh, Soren asked that question, and Soren, I'll, I will share with you a whole list of Esri uh, COVID-19 related um, maps that they've been pushing out. And I saw this afternoon the hospital beds. Map. Yeah, I just did that. So um, did create that one. Mm -hmm. One of them. Uh, I don't know if you saw the one that I made, but I can share my screen. Um, so. Oh, it was the one you made because I saw it come across your Twitter. <laughs> oh, okay. And they get retweeted by others. <clears throat> yeah, so hospital beds is going to be an increasingly important thing that we think about and that we talk about. It was this one. So um, here's a story map. And it's important when I need I'm to share your screen. Oh, I thought I was. You had clicked off of it. There we go. Remember what I said about computer illiteracy? I haven't it's quite okay. gotten I'm here all to help. the way. <laughs> yeah, so. This is just uh, one data set. It's hospital beds. And then um, looking at the per capita representation per hospital bed. In a lot of places, you know, you've got pushing a thousand people um, represented by one hospital bed in their county, you know. So the per capita breakout is, is interesting and important. So all I do here is I just start filtering it down. Say, so here's where there's lots of beds per person. It's really not many people per bed is how it really breaks out. Um, and here's where it's rather extreme. You've got uh, 500 plus people per bed on, in the best case scenario. And then here's where it's 750 people per bed, best case scenario. And it's not a very good case. Uh, here it is if you restrict it to only places where there's 100,000 or more, right, to get a sense of the magnitude. Um, and that's interesting, but it's also important to pull that into the context of things that will aggravate that situation, like an elderly population who appears to be more um, susceptible to the effects of COVID-19. I'm worried about my dad. He's 79 and he has breathing issues. And he lives right here at the tip of this mitten. Um, and so that's something I think about a lot. And I want to do whatever I can to kind of help. You know, what, what am I going to do? But I can take data and I can break it out into interesting or easy to understand ways so that people who are much smarter than me and actually doing valiant work can take this and maybe get some insights and maybe use it as a tool to do their job. So I'm just hopeful that maybe it can help somebody. Right, here's underlying health conditions. You know, it's, they're less healthy in these areas and more healthy here because underlying health conditions are having a lot to do with people's susceptibility to COVID-19. Food security is something I'm thinking about more now, you know, as we're sheltered in place and we haven't gone out for two weeks. Um, we're, I have as, I have for myself the first time felt the sensation of food scarcity, which is, is weird. Um, yeah. I'm so privileged to have never thought about that before. I can always just go get more. Well, when you can't necessarily just easily go get more without um, inheriting some sort of risk associated with that, you know, food scarcity becomes something that many Americans are thinking about now for the first time, but can also help us empathize with people who live with it every day. You know, a lot of people don't have a grocery store in their neighborhood. They have to go to the gas station and the health options there are obviously poor. Um, and so it's, it's an opportunity for us to not only you know, pay special attention to areas that are food insecure, but also understand that phenomenon ourselves a little bit. Anyways, that was hospital beds. The other one is age and social vulnerability, which is a similar kind of thing. 
Mm. Well, yeah, that's an interesting thought. Um, we have a, I have a couple of questions that have come into me privately um, and a couple that are public as well. And some of them sort of wrap together, so I'm going to blend them. Um, so folks have been asking things like, um, if you want to elicit a particular response, what color palette would you use? Or if you have um, some of the uh, favorite color references. So if you aren't thinking of a palette, where, where do you go for your color references for best practices? Yeah, uh, good question. That's a great question. Um, while I'm pulling something up, well, let me share my screen again. Screen two, share. <clears throat> um, if you're making a map, there's there's a pretty good, very well known tool called Color Brewer. Two because they made an update to the tool. Color Brewer. Thank tool. you, thank you, thank you for sharing this because I use this one in my classes as well. <laughs> yeah, it's nice. It it was. Designed by Cynthia Brewer and Mark Harrower when he was a grad student. Now he's a dynamo geographer out there making crazy cool maps and tools to make maps really is what he does. Um, so you can pick the color scheme that looks good to you. You can say, do I want it to be sequential, sequential or diverging, qualitative as opposed to quantitative? Um, how many classes do you want? And it, it's, it's really great. Uh, and you can just copy the hex values or export it as a little CSV or a, a little text document, I think. That's a nice option. Um, now, when it comes to scientific visualizations, really nice and dramatic set is the Virdis, Virdis color set. Um, I'll just click on this and cross my fingers. Yeah. So there's a few different color ramps, but they're designed to be um, colorblind friendly. So if I'm a color deficient person, these will still be interpretable. I can apply data to these, make a map, and I would still know that this is one end of the spectrum and this is the other end of the spectrum. Rainbow color schemes are a huge no-no. Do not ever do a rainbow color scheme. Um, they are pretty, but they're inappropriate for scientific visualization, not because of manners or snottiness, but because um, people perceive them wrongly. And there's a lot of errors that happen when people interpret a rainbow color scheme viz. So this bright cyan band and this bright yellow band create artificial spikes in the perceived luminance. And so it, it creates data where no data actually exists. So using a rainbow color scheme is a big no-no even though uh, three quarters of scientists use it. Um, <clears throat> but these are a great alternative to that. Uh, another tool that I use a lot is this little browser plugin I have, and there's a lot of them. I just happen to use this one called No Coffee Vision Simulator. And what this is, is essentially empathy goggles for people with color deficient eyes. Um, and you can choose the form of color deficiency and it will replicate for you as best it can what somebody with that color deficiency would see. And so you can test run the visualizations that you make. Am I able to see a difference? Yeah. And it's it's really helpful. I, I use this a lot. I use this all the time. So that's the Viridis color package, V-I-R-I-D-I-S. And then Color Brewer of course is like an old standby. <clears throat> I had never seen the no coffee vision simulator. I'd seen a couple of them online. So thank you for sharing those. Yeah, you're right. There's another thing called color Oracle, which you can install on your machine, but I've never had good luck with it. It doesn't seem to work consistently for me. Sometimes I just can't get it to run. So I, I like this. Most of the time I'm looking at something in a browser anyway. Yeah. And, no and I'm, um, I have another question in here. I've got to find it. Hold on. Um, so, I lost it. Hold on a second. I know someone asked a question and I'm looking for it. Um, oh, so thinking about things that end up being politically managed or thinking about sources of reliability of data, um, as a cartographer, how do you kind of deal with that issue of reliability or something that ha has a political overtone to it? And I've seen you and Ken, um, and I know Ken can typically talk a little bit differently about this with the British accent, but um, 
but what are your thoughts on kind of how you as a cartographer deal with some of that? You mean like calling out bad maps, that kind of thing? Um, or how do I find the, reliable data? How do you find reliable data or how do you think about the sources and the reliability of the data um, or something that might be, be politically managed? Yeah. Well, yeah, that's really important. I, I think there's just so much data out there that is good and authoritative that I don't have to worry about it a whole lot because a lot of the data that I'm using comes from like you just saw NASA. I mean, NASA, okay, good. Good job, NASA. I'll take it. Yeah, I trust NASA. They're a reputable place. Um, and the U.S. Census, the Department of Census, um, I use a lot of census data. That's good. American Community Survey data from the census is something I, I use a lot. Um, and another source is Esri manages something like this because they, they know people have this sort of issue. Um, this is kind of like a growing repository, almost wiki-like where people can um, share their data and Esri will actually have a staff of human beings review it and, and mark it as being verifiable and acceptable for scientific use, which is really cool. That's a good resource. I actually work on this team. Um, and so you can search for anything, I don't know, um, virus, and it'll give you content that you can use. Um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of and options. If I'm using data, generally it comes from a place that I know, and well, I, I wouldn't go to a random website. <laughs> so how do you deal with uncertainty in the data? Um, so one of the things that I showed last class for the class was we took the, the Johns Hopkins map and we zoomed in on Williamsburg and of course the dot is a centroid so it shows up on someone's house. Mm. Um, yeah. you know, and, and how people interpret that who may not be cartographers or people familiar with GIS and the word centroid is that, mm. you know, the, there are four cases and, you know, one death or whatever that they're seeing that pops up when they click on it on this person's house, but also just general uncertainty that comes along with data. That's the, yeah, that's the trick with data because it, if you have a point in your data set, um, it's an explicit latitude and longitude value and it will appear as a discrete, I'm here and I'm not anywhere else point on your map. And that's, it, it might not actually be specifically at that location, you know, like when you're um, looking at your location on a phone or an iPad, it might put you at the street address at the, at the curb of the house you're in if you're using Wi-Fi instead of um, the cell tower location, right? It doesn't know that you're inside the house. It'll put you at the curb. So there's that sort of uncertainty. But then there's also the effect of, let's say you've got, a map of airports and you just use a discrete little point symbol for an airport. That's not the best way to visualize an airport. When you've got an airport, it has an influence on its surrounding area, right? You can hear an airport as you get close. You can see the economy change as you get closer to the airport as um, the built environment is there to support the infrastructure of the airport. Everything has, this is the first law of geography. First law of geography, Waldo Tobler, is everything is related to everything else, but nearby things are more closely related. And that's something I think about a lot. Um, and I've got a style of cartography that I call Firefly, and it uses a glow effect to simulate the effect that, you know, this is here because the data has to exist somewhere, but it has an influence on its neighbors, right? And it's it's a glow effect. Uh, a, it honors the first law of geography in that um, nothing is truly fully discrete. You've got bleed over into surrounding areas. And B, glowing stuff looks cool, right? So um, that's kind of a popular option. It's a style that you can download and use in your own maps really easily. I've kind of pre-baked a bunch of line and polygon and points for people so they can make glowy maps. You know, you just, glowy maps. So if, so if stuff glows, it does an okay job of saying it's relatively uncertain. I um, love that you called it Firefly, by the way. Oh, thanks. <clears throat> um, 
And that, that leads to another question that someone else asked. Um, this one came in in a post-it from my own household. Um, it, uh, because my other half is also a GIS person. So um, this is your favorite or default Esri base map that you start from. Is it a light map or a dark map or one of your new ones? Oh, this is for me? Yeah, it's for okay. you. Okay, yeah, I'll get there. Oh, by the way, so before we get too far from uncertainty, somebody literally oh. today asked me about that because they had gotten their DNA test results. They had seen somebody on Twitter show the map of their DNA test results and the person said, you know, uh, you know, it says I could be anywhere from the Arctic Peninsula all the way down to the Black Sea. This is a little bit vague for an ethnic data set. And ethnography, of course, historically is going to be very fuzzy and hard to pin down. And so when you've got these discrete polygons, that's a little bit silly. Uh, and so the comment was, it would be nice if you could have a glow effect. And somebody asked if you can make a glow effect, like a soft edge to represent uncertainty. So we were just talking about that today. Twitter is a hot spot of cool questions and cool inspiration. So here's that map. Tom said, Tom, actually the guy who Tom. does. Yeah. yeah. I saw that one too. <laughs> he's the Shaded Relief Archive guy. And he's like, here's my ethnicity, but you know. Mm -mm. And <laughs> somebody said, is there a way to produce polygons with fading edges to represent uncertainty? So these are things we're always thinking about. A lot of people do a lot of work on it, but um, this is just something that, that you can do. Okay. Your question was, what base map do I go to? I like the very basic light or very basic dark vector base maps um, because I almost never do full imagery. Let me, let me get rid of this for a sec. I almost never do an imagery base map like this. Um, let me get my projection to a web map projection. Um, I like the dark gray canvas if I'm doing thematic mapping because it visually recedes into the background and the data that, that, that I have sitting atop this map really shines. And that's the whole point. A thematic map is there to communicate the theme. And if your base map is stealing uh, the show, then it's, it's, it's a disservice to your map. So I like very muted, uh, receded background maps. Um, so that's the dark, gray canvas. Here's the light gray canvas. It's really good for just placing data and doing thematic mapping. Um, now, what I was saying about the imagery stealing the show because of all its bright colors and, and textures, um, that can be a real issue. So <clears throat> let's say I've got some data that I'm working with here. The imagery is just so bright and beautiful and shouting at me that this is what I'm going to notice if I make a thematic map. Um, but I made actually for the firefly style in general, a firefly base map, which is desaturated and darkened so that you still have the context of the texture of the surface of the earth and you can see where things are and the general landform characteristics there, but you don't have the full saturation competing with the overlaying thematic things that are probably using color to communicate. And if I've got a bunch of colored points and polygons up here, a bright, vivid imagery base map will will pollute that in my visual interpretation because things will look different. So that's that's what Firefly is for, just as a more subtle background map for thematic mapping that needs an imagery base map. That's awesome. And this week or last week, my days are running together because we're you know all yeah mine too in isolation. Um, you also released some blank base maps, which made me laugh because I was like, I'm always telling students to start, don't start with one of the, the given base maps, but um, but think about using something blank and creating your own uh, color behind it. Um, yeah, yeah. The reason I did that is because in, um, I can't grab a tile here. So in ArcGIS Online, it, it, you can't really set the background color of your map. And so you get this default gray background. So uh, let's go to this. And not to surprise you, I'm going to um, mute my video for a second. Sure. So yeah, I have black 
white, black and white blank base maps. And so I'll open this. So now if I'm starting from scratch in ArcGIS Online and I want to make a map, I can pull in things and start mapping, um, but I'm going to have a black background. And let me, maybe I'll illustrate that for you. So here's my, here's an imagery base map. Let's say you want to have an imagery base map. Um, if I add, actually, let me go back. Ah. Let's add imagery. Okay, so if I don't have this black base map, when I zoom in really fast, depending on the way the tiles load, I get big flashes of white, right? You know what I mean? And it's distracting, but now I have big flashes of black. At least it's a color that's more suitable to the image overlaying and it's not like flashing light bulbs in my eyes. Uh, so that's, that's the main reason I did it. Um, yeah, and you you aren't stuck. Sense. Yeah, you aren't stuck with black or white. It's it's easy to actually change the style here. You can open it up here, and then <clears throat> just pick a different color, and then hit save, and it'll make it a version for you. In you know, let's say I want a turquoise background because I've got um, an oceanic map, and I don't want to. I want to show a turquoise background when people pan fast. So you can do that. Nice. Well, I want to thank you for your time. Um, I know that I asked for a half hour demonstration and then a little bit of Q&A and we've been on for over an hour. So I don't want to take up any more of your time. But um, on behalf of my students and the faculty members that are here and others, I, I really do want to thank you for this. I think that has been an amazing opportunity um, to see a genius in action with cartography. It's, um, it's a stooge. A stooge. Well, this is one hour of your allotted time on this earth that you cannot have back. It's gone. <laughs> but anyways, it was an honor, like I said. I, anything yeah. I can do to help, especially in a situation like this, good grief. So I'm happy yeah. to chat with folks and especially students. And it's an exciting time. And it sounds like it's a really cool course. How many people, how many people were online? What did we get to? Uh, we had 27 at the peak. We've had a couple of people who text messaged me and said, I've got to hop off, but please tell me there's- Unacceptable. <laughs> So, um, yeah, so we, I did record it and I'll post it up. I'll uh, shoot you the link um, and as well as my students and some other folks as well. Um, but thank you so much. Um, and I'm going to stay on with my class just to talk to them really quickly. So thank you to the other people who joined us um, as well. And I'm going to stop the recording right here.